All right, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight uh, for our talk with Tori Stevens for Climate Prep Week 2023. Um, before we begin, we're gonna read a quick bio for Tori because that is super important that you get to know who our speakers are. Uh, Tori Stevens creates opportunities that transform organizations and shift cultures. He is a resource generator and a community builder for social justice issues, people, and movements. He currently works at Grist Magazine as their climate fiction creative manager and uses storytelling to champion climate justice and imagine green, clean, and just futures. In another life, he owned a kick butt sweater uh, streetwear company, and he would have gotten away with eating the last cookie too if it weren't for his three meddling kids. Great bio. So everyone silently welcome Tori with a nice round of applause. Tori, thanks so much for being here. Um, so the way this is going to work, I've got a bunch of interview questions for Tori, and then at the end, we're going to do a Q&A. So if you've got questions, just you can pop them into the chat now, and I'll try to keep track of them. Um, but you can also save them for the end, and we can just ask them from there. So uh, without further ado, our first question is, uh, let's start with the basics. So who are you, and what do you do for a living, Tori? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me, Tori. It's really great to be here. I am going to start telling you about who I am by starting where I, uh, I'll start telling you a story about how I started storytelling. So I, for the longest time, I was a fundraiser um, for about 15 years. I wrote the appeals that you get in the, uh, in the mail, um, and now you probably get them in your inbox and on social media. But I, 15 years ago, sending letters um, to people's actual <laughs> addresses was the way to go. And I wrote those appeals and I did it for folks living with HIV and AIDS. I did it for the protection of Medicaid and Medicare and folks that use those um, services. And then I did it for the Affordable Care Act, um, otherwise known as Obamacare. And during that time, I really fell in love with the craft of, you know, trying to get people to understand how important it is to, for, for whatever cause it was. Um, many of the times, um, folks in the industry were leaning on statistics. And I thought that was like, I just didn't, it didn't sit well with me. It wasn't like the, I, I didn't think it was a good story. So, you know, you get the appeal, it tells you that if you give X amount of dollars, you're going to be able to help 100,000 people in the last quarter, they were able to, you know, help this many people. And so to me, that wasn't really resonating. And um, along came this uh, blog called Humans of New York. Does it, I hope people know of this blog. It's like, this gentleman just interviews a random person in New York and, you know, asks them just questions about their life. And it went viral. It really did well. And the reason it did well is because people love to know this. what's the story of that individual. And so I started changing my appeals so that they were more focused on individuals and less heavy on the statistics side of things. So that's how I got um, involved in storytelling and ended up later on fast forward to Grist Magazine. Um, so currently I work at Grist Magazine, not as a fundraiser but as um, the lead for their climate fiction initiative. I'm also the founder of it as well. There was a few of us that founded this initiative a few years ago. Um, and so now we have a climate fiction initiative called Imagine 2200, which is focused on uh, climate solutions, um, storytelling, um, intersectional characters, social justice. And we try to wrap that all into an amazing story um, so yeah, that's what I do at, um, Grist and, uh, it's how I make my living. Awesome. We love learning background. It's always fun. Um, the next one we got is, so Grist focuses on real world climate journalism and storytelling. Why did it feel important for you to focus on like fiction for this initiative? Yeah, so Grist is a journalistic organization. It is a nonprofit independent news organization that has been around for about 20 plus years. And, you know, every day we're cranking out news that is focused on the climate crisis, getting out of the climate crisis, what environmental justice stories are out there. And generally just like really 
reaching people who are interested in news. But that's not like every conversation on the web is not about news, right? You know, so a lot of people get their orientation from TV shows, other people get their orientation or like the things they're going to talk about with their family and friends and, you know, think about in their mind um, from a lot of uh, angles. And so in the beginning of COVID, we had a um, visioning session with some folks that we have on this list called the GRIS 50 list. Um, if you haven't heard of it, you should check it out. I'll talk about it real quickly just to get you there about like what it is. Basically, it's um, a Forbes 50 list, but it's focused on folks in the climate sector who are helping us get to that clean, green, just world. So we feature about feature 50 people every year. And we had this really amazing dinner um, in New Hampshire under the stars. It was nighttime. There were fireflies. It was gorgeous. And we were asking those folks, like, Grist has been at this for 20 years. What would be exciting if for Grist to kind of get involved in that would be, you know, different, reach people in a different way, in an emotional way, just like not in a newsy way. We would still produce the news, but we really wanted to know from these um, thought leaders and folks in the industry, like, what would be interesting? And so we sent them off in these really small groups and they pitched an idea, a vision to each other, but then they also had to um, decide out of the five people they were in the um, group with, what was the best one out of their group. So then they came back with five solid ideas. They had to pitch that in front of the whole group. And then the big one that really attract was attracted to us because we were already talking about it and thinking about it was climate fiction, a term that I didn't even know about three years ago. Um, so. Yeah, we um, the idea of climate fiction came up at this visioning retreat and Grist had already been thinking about it because, as you know, we have editors, we have writers, we're connected to other literary organizations, news organizations, it just felt right to kind of explore that. And other magazines that do news also have a literary section. And so, yeah, we greenlit it and um, we put some stories out into the world. We uh, by first first we contracted with like some writers to kind of write climate fiction to see how that felt while we were workshopping what the climate fiction contest could be. Because one of the things I wanted to bring to the table was not just having this be like something that Gris does, but something that the public does. Like how do we get the public energized and excited to write a story about how we can have a better future? Um, and so it took a little while to kind of workshop that. In fact, we um, convened another group of folks to envision, and I think this is really important because the big thing about futurism and the project is a futuristic project, it's a futurism type project where we're dreaming and envisioning what the future could be, is this aspect of it, which I used to think of as woohoo. Like if you, you asked me about this like woohoo business of, visioning i just it wasn't something that i had been interested in or thought was useful uh, goes to show like my age and or like at the time like I, the lack of wisdom i guess um so we brought together a collective of people uh to again talk about not now that we had decided climate fiction i really wanted to know what kind of climate fiction and so bringing together justice leaders bringing together folks that from the climate solutions um, tech sector, bringing together activists and different people, you know, things that themes that came up were all these things that like a lot of people in the environmental movement would call adjacent to, I think are central. If you ask anyone who's like on a frontline community in Louisiana or in the global South, they're going to say these things are central. But at the, you know, a lot of like environmentals, environmentalists, old school environmentalists didn't think about racial justice, didn't think about land back movement, you know, giving land and ceding land back to the indigenous folks, um, reparations, LGBTQ um, issues and how those intersect with climate and things of that nature. So the folks at this visioning session really focused on a lot of that. Um, and just to add a little thing that another neat thing that happened was the visioning session we did, we had a facilitator come in to help do this visioning session because I wasn't like the perfect person to do that at all because I thought it was a whole bunch of woohoo. But I, I, you know, I was trusting in my team members and thought this was the way you go. 
And the person surprised me by saying, you know what we're going to do? I used to play Dungeons and Dragons. I did not. Um, and they said, we're going to create a Dungeons and Dragons styled climate fiction game to put these four people, again, we're separating people in groups and we separated people in groups of four or five and they went on this quest. And the goal was to get to a clean, green and just world by the time they got to, there was like a timeline. And so by the time they got the 2200, you know, on their quest with these four people that they don't know in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> um, and it was amazing to read their timelines. I, after the event, read their timeline, sat with them for a couple months, and there was these visions and all these ideas and themes. And some of the themes were the, some of the things I mentioned that I wouldn't have included in the climate fiction initiative if I hadn't been in touch with these folks. You know, the land saying that in this climate fiction initiative, we want uh, intersectional stories, stories that have rich, layered folks whose identity will not be compromised and whose identities are central to the story. Um, we want, you know, stories that touch on issues that aren't just the climate crisis, that intersect and are woven, you know, so racial justice or racial injustice is very much focused on climate injustice. And you'll see that on um, with frontline communities. So yeah, that's a little bit about how this came to be. Um, and then, so the reason Grist is like approaching this has to do with the fact that we wanna have conversations with people about the climate crisis. Um, and it doesn't just have to be people that are focused on the news. So how do you reach those other people? We think that climate fiction for us is a good way to reach people. You know, I have, I do talks um, in different cities and different spaces and people come up to me after. And I just remember this one woman saying like, I haven't listened to the news or watched the news in 10 years. And like, for me, that's like, I was, I didn't really believe her at first, but like she was real and I take people for what they say. And then I've had other people who say they just they think the news is device divisive and like, you know, negative and it's just not focused on solutions. And I know that not everyone believes that, but there's a good segment of people who believe that or just, you know, it's not like we can only just watch the news. Like there's a lot more exciting things. And I think storytelling is um hits people in an emotional way. And so that's why Grist is willing to try this out. Um, and so three years later, here we are, a couple of awards and we're still trying it out. I love the idea of uh, climate fiction and Dungeons and Dragons. That's wonderful. <laughs> that so like we should a, make that a game. That'd be great. I mean, I'd be surprised if someone wasn't trying to do it right now, because it's. I'm always like, if you can think it exists, someone is trying to do it at this moment. Um, doing Dungeons and Dragons in like libraries is a big thing right now, like using it to teach kids math, okay. using it to teach kids like social skills. So like all for it. Um, Next question we got, so building off of that, um, what role do you think fictional storytelling has to play in climate solutions and environmental justice? Right, so I talked a little bit about this, but I didn't really get into it. So the specifics of it is that um, there's a lot of studies out there that say that, you know, this facts, statistics, those sort of things, like they might move some people, they might educate you, they might um, be something that you have to help guide you, but a story, it, it moves people in a different way. And so a story can, you know, the way you can recant a story to someone else is a lot easier than kind of like, hey, you know, these statistics say this, like it just doesn't really um, work that, that well for some people's brains, for a lot of people. Um, and so on the, let's start with the climate solution side of things. So. Um, in these stories that we have um, for Imagine 2200, uh, it's speculative fiction. It's uh, ideas and um, the type of fiction where, you know, this is, sci-fi is similar to sci-fi in that, you know, a lot of people will say that, you know, the cell phone was first, like, the first idea of it was in Star Trek with the, um, I'm not a Trekkie, so I forget the name of the things they had, but um, um you know, the, the, their idea of a cell phone, right? And so in speculative fiction, why can't we explore um, visions and ideas for how we can get out of this climate crisis and, and maybe in 15, 20 years, things that people envisioned 
in these books, in these uh, stories will end up becoming real because somebody in the real world will say, well, that's a brilliant idea. Let me like work on that from like a hard science um, side of things. So that's one aspect of it, like the imagination. That's why we call this an Imagine 2200 project. That is huge. Like just, you know, letting people's minds freely and creatively think of ways that we can get out of this climate crisis, right? So I think there's an abundance of um, dystopian stories, um, like lots of what could go wrong, right? And so, you know, some of the first climate stories out there are like disaster stories. And even some of the big novels that are out there are focused on the disasters. And so we're trying to do something different and focus on uh, the solutions. So um, focusing on tech solutions and then on the environmental justice side of things, a lot of the problems that I think we're having are inter interpersonal, societal, um, you know, justice related um, and exploring those in books also have a benefit. You know, you can explore alternative ways of being with each other as people, collective societies show up a lot in, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll say like we, just to give you some background of how many stories we're receiving, cause that will put some color to how much, I, how many ideas people are kind of ruminating and generating. So the project itself, Imagine 2200 is a global contest that um, sources stories from around the world. So we put ads in fiction magazines, fantasy magazines, um, newspapers, you know, use social media and um, people submit stories. And over the past three years, we've received 2,900 stories. Yeah, 2,900 stories have been submitted to us. And so people, and, and we create the prompt and the guidelines and make it so that people aren't thinking about dystopian stories because we don't accept those kind of stories. So we want hopeful stories. We want um, stories that are focused on the solutions. We want stories that include marginalized individuals um, and are culturally authentic and will not compromise people's identity. I always say this thing, I don't want, I don't want stories with Lego people. So if I can take the head off and like attach it onto another person and like the story still flows, that isn't an imagined 2200 story because we really want that cultural aspect, that, you know, identity driven story. And so exploring the environmental justice side of things in these stories and how and what a clean, green and just world actually looks like and not in a utopian way. I'm fine with utopian stories. We get them, we've even published them, but we're more interested in like, there's this newer term um, called through utopia where you're kind of, it's came out of the UK, it's not that old. Um, it's because there was a lot of climate fiction stories come out of the, coming out of the solar punk genre that seemed more, they weren't utopian, they were more like, how do we get, they're like a manual looking backward from the, like the future, like being like, here's how you get to this beautiful um, world. And so I would say that a lot of our stories are either, they run, they're on like a spectrum, but there's like the, and this pertains to environmental justice because I think we need to decolonize our imagination. Um, and so what does that mean? That means like thinking outside the normal Western storytelling view. And so right now, one of the trends is, as I've been talking about, is dystopia. And so I think dystopian stories, they have lots of value. They're a clarion call as to what we don't want in the world, but like, I think there's like a bit too much of it. Like, you know, that's fine. Read them. I read them. Like some of my favorite stories, like Mad Max, love it. Like one of my favorite Mad Max Fury Road, Fury Road, love it. But I think we do need like a lot more of like, what kind of world do we want to live in? And so Imagine 2200 has been receiving those type of stories and publishing them. And I think that has been, and especially since, the stories have been sourced, not all of them, but a lot of them are sourced from folks on the front line or about frontline communities, which in the climate fiction world, um, you know, things are changing very rapidly. But if you look back at like the stories that have been, um, the novels that have been sold and the most um, uh, high selling, 
they, they've been dystopian and very much not focused on frontline communities. It's interesting when you say that because like as a librarian, you get <clears throat> one of the things you get trained in is like reader's advisory. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm looking for this kind of story or that kind of story or whatever. And whenever people want sci-fi, I can give you like a hundred different post-apocalyptic, real dark sci-fi options. And you're like, hey, give me like a happy one. I'm like, uh, Becky <laughs> Chambers, Becky Chambers, like Psalm for the Wild Build. And then after that, my knowledge of it just like drops off. So I'm pumped that you're doing this and I hope different works like this find their way into libraries. Um, the next, the next question we have kind of, you've covered a bit. I don't know if you want to dig into it slightly more or if we want to just jump to the next one. Um, but it was, uh, imagine 2,200 focuses on hopeful climate fiction. Why not just climate fiction? Which you, you pretty much addressed, but is there anything else you want to add to that before we jump forward? Yeah, I mean, I think like I did answer it. I'll just like put a, um, uh, I, I can talk a little bit about it, a, a little more about it, I should say, is, um, you know, it, there was a good study, um, and this one comes out of Hollywood. I sit on the Hollywood Climate Summits board, and there was a study by one of our partners, uh, Good Energy. I don't know if there's notes to this program, but this is a good one, um, if there are notes that you can add to like whatever page this is set up on, or just you could write this down. There's a really good outfit out there, an organization called Good Energy, and they are a advocacy organization that is, they do two things, they do research and they do advocacy. So the advocacy that they're trying to do is advocate for more um, climate fiction stories to end up in our TV programs, TV series like Netflix and Hulu and all those things. And then, so that's their advocacy side, side trying to get Hollywood to, to kind of speed more plots, narratives, storylines that deal with this crisis. One of the, the biggest, I would say, <laughs> this to me, this is existential. Um, that's why I do this work. And so um, I think it's really important that our stories kind of tell that um, story as well. But what they found, and this is just, so what they did was they looked at keywords across TV and um, movies, TV, you know, series, things that you watch. And they use keywords like global warming, climate crisis, climate, um, you know, environmental disaster, things of that nature. And what they found was 3% of our stories that we view um, from movies to TV series, 3% have storylines and mention the climate crisis. How is that, right? Like we have all these issues in society, right? There's like, if you kind of cut them up and there's a pie, there's like, you know, healthcare, climate, crime, um, you know, education. Like you have all these things that you could talk about. We have shows on education, right? We have definitely a lot of shows on crime. Um, we have, um, you know, there's a there's just so much out there that Hollywood is. Um, producing stories on, but why not this one thing? Um, so they're advocating to have more stories that are um, focused on climate fiction. And so that's an, that's one of the reasons we're focused on climate fiction. And the reason, so that's the first part of the answer. We're focused on climate fiction because we don't think there's enough of it being discussed and, you know, out there. The second part of the um, your, your question around why hopeful climate fiction? Well, Grist, the organization I work at, has always been this irreverent, hope-filled like place. Like we've always focused the the news side of things. Like for the last twenty years, has it, it was never a place that was focused on like the doom and gloom. Actually, one of our taglines I forget it because it was it predates me, but it was like. Yeah, we just like always said the line, we're not focused on doom and gloom, right? We're focused on like educating people around like what's going on in the crisis, but we're not sitting there trying to hit the button to just scare society and like get those clicks because of like what we're trying to do is get out of the crisis. We want to fix and, you know, live on this beautiful planet and not have it be, you know, terrible for people on the front line and scary for all of us who are watching it kind of like, get hotter and hotter and just more um, disasters pop up. 
so yeah, that I won't go into a, a, a much longer, but that that's kind of like where the hopeful piece is because we think that we need more hope in the climate storytelling side. Got to somehow convince like Marvel that the Avengers need a battle climate fiction, not <laughs> battle climate fiction, but battle climate change for climate fiction. And that, I heard I. So just a funny thing I heard um, that I don't know if people know this one. I'm a big comic nerd. Um, I don't read them as much anymore. But Swamp Thing um, was a character that fought against like this corporate, um, you know, pollute. It was more about pollution. But I think they're rekindling that story or series. And I'm kind of interested in this since we're now in the climate crisis, how the how they're going to change and adapt that story because I don't think it will be just like a pollution story. <laughs> Yeah, dude, Swamp Thing's great. Or just like, <laughs> was it restart uh, like Captain Planet or something? We'll all get the yep. planet rings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember watching a lot of that at like five o'clock in the morning when I was like in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do we got? So question number five is, uh, how did the stories challenge systems of oppression such as structural racism, white supremacy, and settler colonialism? Yeah, I, you know, so we have a book, Afterglow. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the first collect, we didn't plan that. Um, the first collection won an award and then some publishers reached out to us and we, you know, had the talk and there are a few of them. And so we, um, yeah, we uh, produced this book, which is basically, in, I always tell people this because Grist itself is really built on the idea that there should, this content um, shouldn't be gated. So you can buy the book, which I'd be happy if you do, but all the stories are free online too. So, you know, we don't gate our content. Um, you know, this, this crisis is like now real and present in our life. And the real role of journalism and for us storytelling is so that folks can get the information they need and then act on it. Um, so yeah, there's that. So any other stories that you hear me talk about any of this, and I'm sure if, again, if there's some notes um, you can just look up Imagine 2200 and you'll find the stories. If you look up, you can find every single story that we've done by looking up Imagine 2200 about, um, and then you'll be able to find our about me page and then you'll have all the stories. So um, in, yeah, so your question was, again, can you remind me? I was just trying to post that link in there. Let me bring up the question again. Um, it was, how do the stories that you publish challenge systems of oppression, such as structural racism, white supremacy, and settler colonialism? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so in, in the reason I raised up the book and then forgot what I was going to say is because the first collection, they all the collections, um, every year we've shifted the prompt a little bit. Um, so in the first year, we leaned in on intersectionality. And I think like in that year, and we had Adrian Marie Brown as one of the judges, Kiathe Lemon. In every year we've had amazing judges. The second year we focus on cultural authenticity, also important. But in the first year, because uh, intersectionality kind of touches on all the things that you just raised, it's a really easy way to kind of discuss um, the, uh, you know, oppression because, you know, if folks know, um, you know, much of how people experience oppression has to do with their um, identity, you know, so like yeah, um, a queer person um, is going to experience oppression different than a straight person. A black queer person is going to experience um, the, the society, um, the racial aspects of society, like, you know, the harm that comes from that but then also the, the, the way that we treat society en masse, I would say, I'm not generalizing here. Well, I am generalizing here. You know, generally society doesn't treat folks from the LGBTQ community as well. Um, and so we wanted to explore the different intersections when you bring a character that is say, um, like for instance, I'll, I'll use one of our stories. We have a story called Canvas Wax Moon. And it's actually a Wiccan story. I didn't think when I started this initiative that we would get a Wiccan. Um, Wiccan, uh, for folks who may not know, um, folks who consider themselves from, it's a religion 
Um, and the more common term would be like a witch, right? But in like a, a celebrated way. Um, and a, there's a whole like history and way of life of um, folks that are Wiccan. And so somebody submitted a story who is Wiccan um, and the story is about um, a miscarriage or an abortion. It's kind of hard to tell, but like the fact that the story, like if you asked um, women if they've read a climate fiction story that addresses issues that they care about, like in most likely 50 to 60% have experienced like a miscarriage or um, an abortion, um, I mean, it may not be read on the statistic about abortion, but but either way, like th this is something that touches a huge segment of our society and that we want to be talking about. We want to meet people where they are around climate fiction and not have it feel like this thing that you're reading that doesn't like, it doesn't feel right because like, you're like, oh, that's a woman, but like, how come, like, I don't want Lego people. I, like you, if you took the head off the... <laughs> Um, it's spooky season, so we're good. Um, if you took the head off the the character, it, it has to it, it, and pop my head onto that character. It wouldn't make sense because of the things the character is going um, through. So th that's just one example of you know how these stories um, address things that have to do with oppression um, and patriarchy, racism um, to to. Um, in, in other things. Let me give you some more examples because I think the stories are really good at doing that. We have another uh, story from a, a trans femme um, author who is from Bermuda, currently lives in um, Holland and is a contemporary artist, but wrote their first, they saw the prompt, they saw the, the call to action and wrote their, or not wrote their first story, but the first story they've ever written and then submitted for review. And this story, it's called Broken from the Colony. It's a very personal story because you can tell from reading it that this is not someone that's like, I'm gonna write about a trans character. This is someone you can tell from the way they're writing about it, that they're from Bermuda or Barbados, my apologies and that they themselves are trans or are very close to the issue. Um, and the story explores how it feels to be trans in a very conservative, um, black conservative society. Um, but then it also explores like the climate crisis as well. So like that duality and the, or even that complexity is like, and people are complex and have these rich, deeply layered identities and that is something that we want to celebrate um and i really think it's important to be like I, I think there's three things that are really important about that story and some of the others is that we want to celebrate these characters and people we want people to feel welcome in the climate movement um and we want people like dave Chappelle to shut up about trans character trans people like this idea that folk that their situation is funny or laughable is, is not a good look and like you know we flip that on its head and that's why it's you know so when I say hope hope is like it's like hope it's joy it's celebration um it's a lot more than just hope hope is just a quick way to get people there so I think like all of those things are pushing back on white supremacy pushing back on heteronormative um culture that is oppressive to other people and their ways of being so i think building off that like with the idea of hope in this question you've also touched on a little bit beforehand but it, it kind of looking at like the climate fiction and how like the creation of it and then what the like the structure of it and then what the content of it is how did those things help us envision or how do those things create a better future like, I, I guess, like, what are the more concrete aspects of this writing equals results kind of thing? Yeah, that part's up to society, right? You know, like, really, you know, right now, I would say that climate storytelling on the, like, research side, you know, how much does the stories rewrite impact society? And then, like, are people going to act is, like, very nascent like there's not a lot of um, research out there 
However, we do know that storytelling is, you know, this is one of the mediums that we use to kind of communicate with each other. And it's the, it is the most, I would say, important way that we communicate between each other. And so if that is true, and we all believe that, then the types of stories we tell is really important, right? So, you know, we may not have the data um, on, you know, the impact that these stories are gonna have, but I bet that, you know, I'll use a negative to kind of go there. There's um, the, the Turner Diaries is a book that the right wing has um, produced. It, it's not even a great book. <laughs> Um, but it it's a book that has generated a lot of um, it's generated some it's generated people like Timothy McVeigh to act in a negative way, like a, a horrific and murderous way, right? And so, if I I want these, I, we need stuff to stand up again, like to stand counter to that, so, so that if someone's reaching for hope, if someone's reaching for an alternative way of being, or you know, you you need just other images and depictions of how society can show up. So even though like there is a lot of data, like the, the, I, I say there's no like data and like, there's no like, there's not these numbers, like how, but you know, like the Bible is one of the oldest stories and look at how many times like people are motivated by that. Right. And like, there's so many books that you can, you can uh, point to where it has motivated people to kind of, um, you know, either be in community with someone or just a way of being or living their life. So um, if these negative books are out there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm out here trying to do this thing so that there's something for folks that are grasping for hope and an alternative way to view this world and fi find community too, because that's a part of this. Like these stories, like here talking with you folk, like, it, 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 we're all online, we're all interested in this idea of hope and climate fiction, or at least curious about it. And so I, what I've found is I found a lot of community in myself. And so I don't really have an answer to the data side of things, but I, I, I do think that there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of like stories out there that, that point to books and story being really important. I hear you. That'd be crazy if you had some of those statistics that you're like, out of every five science fiction novels, one thing comes true in them, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not going to, uh, like, so I did say that there's not a lot of research. That doesn't mean there's no research. So Yale, um, they have a climate uh, organization. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now, but Yale has a climate organization that looks at, it, it tracks a lot of, like, the political views of how Americans view climate change. And it's been changing. If you add up like now, finally, for the first time, like on the right side of things, there's been like a small percentage of people that believe um, climate change is real and that it's like a uh, uh, existential threat to our way, you know, humanity. Um, that number has gone up. So like if you put like what the left um, and center has for believing it, and you add in now the right believing it, it for the first time has gone up past like 55%. Um, Yale Climate Connections, thank you, whoever put that there. Um, appreciate that. That was a, a real solid. Um, so their, their research has really paved the way and they've been trying to see if climate fiction has been helpful in that regard to get people there. And so they're still kind of, I think the jury is out on it, um, but, yeah, the the piece that I was referencing um, around, you know, we finally moved the notch above 55 to 60 percent um, has to do with the movement. It's not because more people on the left and center have said like, yeah, like that it went from like, you know, 75 to 80 percent to 90. It's because um, more people on the right. I don't know if they have the right prescriptions on what to do about it, but it's still better that they now actually believe it's a real thing. Yeah. So jumping off that, we've got uh, our next one, which is um, what were some of the most surprising and inspiring things you learned from submissions this year or in general? I guess you've done a lot of submissions. so. Yeah, I mean, I think like the biggest thing that it's like less the tech solutions for me. 
and more the like how we can live with each other even after we say we say like we're on the trajectory of the we're pulling carbon out of the climate and you know we all things are saying we're going to avoid tipping points and we're going to you know in 100 to 150 years we're going to correct and solve the crisis there's still going to be the societal problems of um how we treat each other um i there's a lot of stories that are trying to work that out and work out like what do we do after like kind of we've made we feel okay about like the where the crisis the crisis is kind of abated um so the stories where people are just trying to live in community with each other um but there's still like some issues you know you got to live on a farm together and cultivate tea and sell that tea i'm referencing a, a story called seven sisters and then they're having some financial problems and then one of the really uh, beautiful social justice kind of uh, activist tea sellers who's off in Brazil is like, they just had a disaster down there. We have to take in this family and this baby. And, you know, the whole community is like, wait, but we're dealing with like three of our drones are down. We have to pick the tea by hand and we're having trouble. Um, so just like those are those those wrangle things you're gonna have to wrangle with even if we do get all this right there's gonna be still real world problems so we do see a lot of those and those are um you know I think it's inspiring to see people working out like in intercommunal relationships um the surprising ones that I really love are the ones that mix mix like mythological folklore from like say Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia in they are able to lens that on top of like a, another genre that climate fiction is not known for. Like I'm thinking of a detective story, like a detective story or whodunit that has like mythological kind of like underpinnings from another, like a culture that's not mine. Um, because then I like my anthropological mind, I, I studied anthropology when I was um, in like years ago. <laughs> Um, and so like uh, that cultural aspect, I'm like, oh, I get to learn about it, like this culture and like some of the things of their culture. Um, and then I get to get the cli-fi story I want. Plus like it has a whodunit, like murder mystery. So like, you know, the entertainment levels there, the education around like the cultural authenticity piece is there. And so those are the kind of stories that I love and that we do get. The thing that I really want to do and where if you're someone who's, well, I'll just put it out there that one of the aspects of the project that we really would love to amp up is being able to assist the writers. So we only publish 12 stories a year. Um, well, let me correct that. The contests, we, we, we have three winners and nine finalists, and we publish all those stories. And then we've lightly published a couple other stories here and there from that we've noticed in the collection that are really cool and that we should, we think we should get out into the world. But, you know, in three years, we've published like 32 stories, which is, I'm proud of, um, but I would love to publish a lot more. But one of the things is the, uh, the writers, they need some more support. They need like revisions to the story. They need an editor. They need, you know, just like, a, you know, just that that feedback loop that you need as a writer. No writer is going to write something and it'd be perfect off the go, you know? So um, the place where we would love to build out um, is being able to, you know, we have three reviewers every year and then um, who review the thousand stories that come in, they whittle those down to 20 and then we hand them off to the judges. They write these extensive notes um, and they're extensive and they're probably like, you know, two paragraphs to help us keep on target as to like, what value do we think this story is offering? Should it move to the next round? But like, if we had more funding, what we would do is offer like a nice critique to the, for the, for the writer, because they took all this time to submit a story, write a 3000 to 5,000 word story, submit it, fill out the application. We don't have any application fees, which is our way of trying to help. But in the same way, I would really love to encourage, like, encourage these folks to continue at it. Like your story is not bad. It just needs work, you know? Um, and I think that would help because it would get, it would seed more of the landscape with um, these stories that we want out there. That totally makes sense. I'm all for, however you can support the writer, you know, do that. <laughs> which it's not always the easiest thing in the world because funding is always fun, but 
got to do it when you can, right? Um, next one we got going back or more into the writer side of thing is uh, what advice would you give to writers who are interested in writing climate fiction? Well, the first thing I would say is if you write in a genre, so you already write in a genre, romance, um, you know, uh, comedy, um, if you write murder mysteries, lens on a climate plot, like you already write, just, you know, add, weave in the climate. And it doesn't even need to be, I always say this thing when I'm talking in like the, the folks who are kind of trying to move things in Hollywood, I always say this thing like, imagine if the cable guy had been not the cable guy but the solar installer like just the name and like his job it, it, it's like it millions of people are going to view this like that it, the whole story would have been the same but the type of comedy they use the installation like all of it like it really was just like a um a, a, it wasn't like essential that he had to be a cable guy it's just that he was like an everyday guy right so like, why not, you know, a solar installer? So like, do that with your writing um, because you already, are, you already are good at your genre, but just layer in like, you know, why didn't the Death Star have like some crazy solar panels? Like, I don't know, like, you know, I, that's like kind of ridiculous, but at the same time, why not? Like, or even something, you know, like fusion and the like was like the energy that it used or something like that. Just like try to, put hard science and climate solutions and environmental justice uh, and weave that into your story. So that's one thing that I always tell writers. And then the other piece is share your work with other people before you submit it. Even if it's like friends of yours, like just what do you think? Like it doesn't even have to just their hot take on that. Like they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be an editor. It doesn't have to be actually, I, I would say your, your, your best bet in the beginning is your like, maybe not your closest circle because sometimes they're like going to be very nice um but just like it could be like a work colleague somebody that's willing to kind of give you the time or day and then offer some thoughts around it it doesn't have to be advice on how to make the story better it's basically just like what do you think of this story okay. but that's all i got <laughs> no that's great advice you know i think that's that's from a different I watch a lot of author talks and stuff and one of the main things they say is like find a beta reader find someone who like gets what you're trying to do in your story and like maybe that's your mean close friend you know we all have a friend who's like kind of mean like they're, the <laughs> they're gonna give you good feedback you know um <laughs> but I think also like there's so much good like uh science fiction community and fantasy community like genre writing community online and once people can true, get true. into that kind of stuff like that's a great place to find this sort of stuff like you you find your niche of the people who who are writing like I write like weird fiction basically and I've got like a group of people who I can like talk to about that so writers should be searching for their people online <laughs> um yeah that's a good point our um the final question before we jump into the Q&A um and like I said the Q&A start throwing some questions in the in the chat we'll totally ask them as we go um but the last question we have is what are your hopes for the future of the Imagine 2200 contest? That it continues um, because the climate storytelling, the, the field, I would say at this point, because there's all these climate storytelling folks. I was able to meet with a lot of them in what is Climate Week New York or NYC last week. And it's amazing how many, you know, um, from Dear Tomorrow, who is like a campaign where folks, you write a letter to yourself in the future or to your kids or to anyone. Um, and these beautiful letters that they display at museums and they have them um, on these big sheets and you can read them and you can weep too. <laughs> um, to, to the other climate storytelling outfits out there, there's people understand, funders understand the reason for journalism and they fund journalism but right now we're at this point where in the business we call it the product or like the end result like so the stories the the publishing it's running ahead of the advocacy for us so like we're people are interested in the stories we're seeing the views we're seeing the time on a site being longer than the articles that we produce for news but that's also because they're just longer um, but that's still a good sign that people are like sticking with the article when you see like six minutes in the business, like one minute is a long time. Um, that's how short our attention spans are these days. 
Um, but six minutes means like a lot of people read the whole thing and some people exited after a minute, but so it evened out at the average or whatever. And um, so, so we know that the interest is there and that people are interested but um, we're a nonprofit, and so the foundations, the funders, the major donors, those folks don't understand how climate storytelling is part of the, I would say it's one of the tools in the toolbox that is going to help us get us over, uh, through the crisis um, because of that imagination piece, because of that decolonized imagination piece, because of the pulling people in from uh, to, to, to help people feel comfortable in the movement that hasn't felt comfortable if you're doing it in an intersectional way. I think that is really important. Um, and so I guess like my big thing is I just hope Imagine's around in a few years because we got the funding we need. <laughs> I'm, I'm a simple man. I think that's completely normal though. You know, I gotta have people supporting the thing you love so that the thing you love exists in the future. That's right kind of the way that a lot of um, like the genre magazines are dealing with right now because like it's a lot of literary magazines and genre magazines are having hard times with funding and stuff so they're doing different uh, sub subscriber drives and stuff like that and I always try to emphasize to people who I meet in different places to be like hey if you love a thing you got to support it and like capitalism's not great but like you have to monetarily support the thing or else it's not there so is there any way people can like monetarily support 2200 there a thing there. yeah we don't have our yeah we don't have our own website but grist.org uh, does and um if you if you make a donation to grist uh, which is is right we we're committed to being um free and uh we don't have a paywall um but any donations to grist is helpful um again that's grist.org and in the notes section if you put because i love imagine 2200 or you write the development officer or whatever that'd be helpful Thanks, Corey. Oh, and the last thing I have to say is I'm really excited about the strike um, ending for the writers in Hollywood. Um, and a part of their win was that if AI is used, they will be the controllers of AI. And that will be really important as the AI battles between the public and the man or sorry, the managers and the workers plays out across the creative field. The fact that they won that fight and they get to use the tools, because I always say this thing, I don't think AI is necessarily evil or bad, um, but I want the whoever the creatives are that would lose the job, them using the tools to better their writing. So if they're using it, that's fine. They have to disclose it. But like if it helped them generate a better title for their story or if it helped them work out like a little section, you know, that's great. You know, the fact that they will be the ones that benefit from that um, should be how it is. And I think they'll be better at using the tool than like some CEO at the top anyhow. Totally fair. So yeah, so now we have reached the Q&A section. So like I said, start filling up the chat with your questions for Tori and we'll ask them as they come in. Um, again, I just want to say a couple more thank yous as you're generating this. Again, thank you to the Friends of the East Ham Library and for uh, the Brewster Women's Library or Brewster Ladies Library, sorry, for helping fund this. Big thanks to the Blue Marble Librarians for always putting together great stuff for uh, Climate Prep Week. Big thanks to Crew for organizing Climate Prep Week every year and trying to like get the word out about that kind of um, uh, sustainably minded and education on this sort of stuff and just like trying to help people out in general. Um, and big thanks to Tori for doing this. Also, big thanks for all of you for spending your night with us because like you have a thousand other things you could be doing, but instead you're like here staring at your computers like the rest of us. So thanks for doing Yes, that. thank you, thank you. All right. Any questions? Who's got questions? Yeah, Ellen, you can come off mute and ask a question um, with your voice. And other folks that want to just respect Ellen because she's going to go first. Um, so I'm just kind of thinking out loud and I'm just wondering if uh, screenwriting, uh, playwriting is, can be part of um, the 2200 project. And, you know, obviously it would probably be like a section of perhaps. If it's, you know. Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that we get all the time. We Right now, currently, there's folks that are trying to adapt these stories into um, 
they're not trying they're trying to figure out the way that this could become a tv series uh i think the term green mirror has been thrown around which i think is pretty great um but right now we don't do that because it would be hard to run more than one contest so right if we do add a second layer to imagine it would probably be opening it up to people still do um, literary short stories um, but open it up for teens um, or folks at over 12 but under 18. Um, but the screen writing part is something that we have an eye on and that we keep hearing about and we have connections to that world like uh, and so what we do is there's a group called the Blacklist and they, NRDC and the Blacklist run a screenwriting fellowship and we send out the opportunity every year to our writers to inform them about that and tell them like, hey, you should submit your story as adapted as a screenplay, which would be extra work on their part. But it's an opportunity that we have a connection to and we're sharing it with the writers. But for now, it's like three to five thousand fiction short story, basically. Um, yeah. When is mm -hmm. the or is it revolving or? I'm sorry, you I you cut out and I didn't hear the question. Is the submission deadline or is it like revolving throughout the year? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll answer that. Um, so we have a three month window where, where it's open. It's usually in the spring. Um, what I tell people is now that we know that it's annual and um, it's not going away at this point, you can start writing your story at any point, um, get it as good as possible. And then if you get on our email list, which I can look on the web really quickly for that link, and I'll drop it in here. And if you sign up for the email, then you'll see um, we make an announcement by email, like when we're going to um, open the submission portal for you to submit a story. But yeah, it's not a rolling admission. So the next person, for, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say thank you. Um, so the next person with a hand up is Mira. So Mira, if you want to ask your question, go to town. Hey, uh, Tori, thank you so much. This is such a great, um, great talk. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for cli climate science fiction books that you like. I have been like really, as an environmental journalist, I'm really curious about what's happening in the fiction space, which I, which I don't do. And as I've kind of dabbled, I haven't been super impressed with some of the ones that I've seen. I'm just curious if you have recommendations that lean more towards this. I'm hearing good things about Mary Anais Hegler's new one coming up, but um, but it's not out yet. But I'd love to hear any recommendations you have. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a tough question. And it's funny because I should like have a really solid answer for this. But the reason it's hard for me is because I've been, for the last three years, I've focused my reading um, I have three children and it, it, it's like my reading, I have to focus it on the submissions that we get to Imagine 2200. So right now I'm really steeped in um, short speculative fiction stories that don't end up in a contest. <laughs> um, but but what I will say is um, uh, the great transition, there's a couple that I wish I had my Goodreads open right now because there's a couple that have been getting buzz around that I wanna share is uh, the great transition um, from Nick, I think it's Gogans, um, who's a teacher up in Maine. Um, that's one. And then there is another person. I am going to check my Goodreads because I flagged this book. Um, it's another anthology, but it's a hopeful one. Uh, so I will drop those in the chat because I don't have them right now, but I'll make sure to drop them before I... Um, leave, but the other, the other, there are a few that I have um, read. Have you heard of um, the Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson? That one is excellent. Have you read it already? I, okay, it's it's up there. <laughs> oh, so it's on it's on my bookshelf, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> so so that that book is brilliant in that okay. it does a it, it does a lot of things that climate fiction doesn't do. Um, it includes the global south. It is a global story, so it's not just a story about a, you know, New York or you know one slice of the world. It's like this kind of like 
it's a fast paced book. It has ref the Kim Stanley Robinson piece where he's like doing the 3000 view thing, but then coming down and really getting into the story. And then there's like resistance against the fossil fuel companies in a way that I haven't seen. Um, yeah. So like a little eco-terrorism there that what, what would be, you, you know, depends on how you kind of like look at the folks that are like how to blow up a pipeline, you know, that movie that came out. Yeah. There's like, as yeah. there's aspects of the story that kind of have that um, vibe to it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about the book is it has a brilliant idea about finance and how that can become, which I'm usually never attracted to that part of the story. So this is why it really grabbed me. But what if we got paid for the things we, what if we got things called, like, I think in the book, it's called Gaia coins, like Gaia is in the world or earth, um, for like letting your, your lawn go, you get more. For, for every climate, for every action you do that's like good for the climate, you got paid for it. So it, it's an idea. Yeah. I don't know if it would work, but like it, it really there's some cool ideas in that book that just kind of um, spark the brain. And then uh, do you know Anna Lee Newitz? No. Anna, what is her newest book? I started it and it's really brilliant. Um, Terraformers. It's more of a solar punk book. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is about a, a real estate company that is creating worlds um, in the universe or terraforming the world so they're really clean, but there's like something going on in the background that's not huh. right. So, yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. All right. We've got a question from Karen Watkins here. Uh, do you have any suggestions for children's books that install a connection to the earth? That's a good one. No, no, I don't think I do, but I do have children's stories. There's an article today that's floating around that we've been sharing that was about um, octonauts and how that helps children um, like have a climb of vocabulary. Um, I'm gonna share, and then also Molly of Denali, which is another story that, um, or another show. Um, I'm gonna drop this Fast Company article that came out two days ago. So we've been sharing that on the Slack channel at work. Um, yeah, again, the tough thing, and this is where I just wish I had a little bit more capacity with the project is that I'm reading, I'm doing so much of the behind the scenes work, kind of like reading these stories, vetting them, seeing if they could be moved into a different medium, or um, sometimes I'm responding to the notes, like, and being like, no, your story was number 77. Don't give up, like, out of 1,100. That's amazing. So, um, yeah, I, th this, this article is pretty good about... Um, how TV shows can help, but I know that if we want to get kids to be reading a lot more, um, I don't have any good options, but I know they're out there. And always remember. Also, oh. oh, I was just going to respond to Ellen. And also, I do have a lawn, but we've turned a good amount of it into like a um, meadow. support that love it um, i was also gonna say just remember um if you're ever looking for specific types of books you can always show up to your local library and be like hey i'm looking for a book that does x y and z and your library will be able to find it if you're like i want a book that's about hedgehogs who care about solar power who want to go on an adventure in a deep forest they'll will somehow find that book um maybe not that specific book but you can get really crazy with your request and like we usually can come up with something close to that um so any final questions for Tori before we call it a night? I'm scrolling through the chat to make sure I haven't missed anything. There's a question early on, actually. Um, oh, where'd it go? It was from, where'd it go? From David, and I thought it was a cool one. And his question was, how might this, or how might the, the Imagine 2200 uh, be connected with climate art, as in art inspiring fiction, and then fiction inspiring art. Can I 
Yeah, uh, that I, that's something that from the beginning. So we actually think of um, this project not as a, uh, I should have mentioned this, but it's a multimedia project. So all the stories, if you don't have time, you're cleaning your kitchen, you're out walking the dog, you're just taking a walk in the woods and um, you want to listen to a story, all of the stories are at the top of the page. You can click a button and they we have um, voice actors that have brought them to life. So you can listen to them as well. So that's not an art piece, but that is because in the beginning when we were creating this, we had the idea that it'd be a multimedia project. So we've wanted to do mural projects um, in cities. Like we actually thought of doing like these public work style 1930s or 1920s kind of like, you know, like with like the kind of like this kind of we are the workers of the world unite kind of style, but in a green version. So that people can kind of envision um you know, the, the jobs that they might want, um, you know, a kid who's like going through high school or someone who's like, I got to find a new one, new job because my like um, industry is going to be phased out. Um, and then also we produce really beautiful um, art for not just the books, like this art came from the cover of the collection from year one. Um, and so for each story, we have a, um an image that we have as like a um just like it's like the cover for the story and i think i found i'm looking for the story that I just, oh okay um yes it's i'm gonna drop the link in a minute here it is and it's this author in general that is getting a lot of acclaim for producing climate fiction that's hopeful um, and that is optimistic. Um, their name is Allegra Hyde. And I have not had a chance to read her work, but it's like on my like list of, it's like on that shelf, <laughs> like your Kim Stanley Robinson. Can I just ask, is, is Chris based physically somewhere? like? Is there a brick and mortar? Yeah, so we're we started in Seattle, and we're very much for a long time we're a Pacific Northwestern organization. Um, over the last five years to six years, we've been geographical or the geography of like where our reporters and we, this has been intentional because we want the reporters to kind of source more stories that are closer. We want them to come from the places where they're going to be reporting on. And so if you asked me this question five years ago, I would have said that like, yeah, like, you know, 80% of the people that work at Grist are from Seattle or surrounding in the Pacific Northwest. And now it's shifted um, so that like New York is our biggest contingent of staff um, and it's it's more spread out. We have an, um, we've been seeding regional offices at local radio stations in places like Atlanta, Wisconsin and in different spaces that um, have like a little bit of a media uh, desert going on when it comes to like the climate reporting there. So we recognize that rural places right now are really have climate issues and don't have anyone reporting on it. New York Times doesn't show up and I'm, I, I'm a subscriber so I'm not bad about thinking of them. I'm just saying like a lot of these big outlets, including us, for the longest time, we're not paying attention to, you know, some rural areas that have some significant climate issues. Thanks so much for that, Tori. I think um, it seems like we've got no more questions. So I think we're going to wrap it up for the night. Um, at that, I'm going to hit the stop button on the recording.